In this video, we'll be going over systems that Blizzard added to the game that players actually liked. And at number 10, we have the Reforge system. Reforging was a system added in Cataclysm, which allowed you to convert about 40% of a single secondary stat into another one of your choice. And what this meant was basically any piece of gear could be an upgrade. As if your class, which really did not like Critical Strike but wanted as much haste as you could possibly get, you could just reforge 40% of that into haste, and guarantee having haste on all of your pieces of equipment. The most useful part of the reforge system was being able to hit the hit and expertise caps, since those two stats had a certain threshold where you didn't actually want more. For hunters, for example, they only needed 8% hit, and once they hit that threshold, any more hit chance past 8% was a dead stat. Getting up to the hit cap was very useful because it meant you no longer missed. Going past the threshold was completely useless and an absolute waste of stat points. And so with reforging, you could just change all of your hit points into something that's actually useful. Or to manipulate things so that you could hit the exact 8% hit cap, which is what some of the add-ons of the time were designed to do. You'd basically type in what your hit caps were and what secondary stats you wanted the most, and then you would just hit the reforge button and it would auto-calculate all of your gear in order to make sure the correct amount of stat points were allocated to your hit chance in order to hit the hit cap without going over it by much. And then giving you your best secondary stats. Although this created a system where you never wanted to equip a new piece of equipment that you got in a radar dungeon because it would mess up all your stat point values and screw up your hit cap. Which is why when they removed reforging from the game, they did so at the same time that they removed hit caps, because it was kind of an answer to a problem that that stat created, as there isn't really other stat that you gain zero benefit from after a certain point, like the hit cap. So if they were to remove a feature that people liked, they'd also have to remove the stat that it was basically designed to curtail. Although people still want reforging, people would still like the option to reforge their secondary stats into one that's better for them, so people still ask for reforging to be added back to the game, because one of the biggest problems with it was literally just the hit cap being a mess of a stat, and I think Blizzard's a little bit too afraid of people not wanting to equip gear as soon as they get it, which is why they've been removing gems and enchants slowly over time as well. And at number 9, we have the Shadowlands PvP gear system. This is a rather recent addition, basically by completing PvP activities you gain honor and conquest, which can then be used to purchase any piece of equipment you want from the vendor. Then you can use honor and conquest in order to upgrade those pieces of equipment, but the cap doesn't increase until you hit certain rating thresholds, which encourages players to actually compete in PvP to max out their gear. It's a pretty simple system of just earning the currency to buy all the gear you want by doing the activity you want to do, and then also increasing the power level of your gear as you get to higher levels of PvP, which then allows you to spend the currency you get from doing all that PvP in order to upgrade the gear that you just unlocked. It's a system that basically feeds into itself, and allows you to completely choose over which pieces of gear you want first, and was competitive with other hard-to-get gear in the game. The Shadowlands PvP system at launch was so good that PvE players were participating in PvP en masse in order to gear up for raids in Mythic Plus Dungeons, instead of the other way around, which has historically been the case. In fact, everybody liked the system so much that they wanted a system like this to exist for PvE content as well, which again has historically been the other way around when it comes to PvP gearing. It turns out people like to be able to slowly acquire currency to pick out which pieces of gear they want to buy, and then upgrade those pieces later on instead of having to replace them. So, in the very next patch in Shadowlands, Blizzard added a kind of uh, ghetto system of it for Mythic Plus Dungeons, where they added a way to upgrade pieces of equipment you got from Mythic Plus Dungeons, but they didn't add a vendor which allows you to buy any piece of gear you want for the currency. So it's just a half implementation of the PvP gearing system. You still had to get the gear through random chance, but you could upgrade it all the way to max, after completing Keystone Master achievements and having enough Valor points. Since this is a relatively new feature, it's kind of low on this list, but it is one of the new features that is pretty universally well liked, which is pretty rare for a new feature, as most of the time people complain incessantly about anything that's new in the game. And at number 8, we have the Glyph system. This is a system which was added in Wrath of the Lich King with a brand new inscription profession, and basically added another layer of customization to your class. You had three major and minor glyph slots to fill out, with the major slots giving you a DPS increase and the minor ones giving you a minor benefit that bordered on cosmetic, with only a few rare of them actually increasing your DPS. And players did like being able to increase the damage of their main abilities, or add extra effects to them, like how the glyph of death and decay gave them the ability every chance it did damage to also fear the target in place. 
And while the quality of the glows varied pretty heavily, from being completely overpowered to being relatively minor, it was a further way to customize your character that players rather liked. The problem was that the customize your characters too much. You had to spend money on glyphs in order to be competitive, and some of the best glyphs might cost a little bit too much money, and they were consume on use. So you had to constantly buy new glyphs if you wanted to swap them out for whatever reason. And because of that, most people would just buy whatever their best glyphs were, and then just never change them out. Even if it would work better for a certain fight or in PvP situations. And they were much more impactful than gems or enchants. So it was a little bit of a problem that you had to spend money in order to customize your base class. So in Cataclysm, they changed the system. Making it so when you bought a glyph, you learned it permanently and can change between it by just buying an inexpensive material. And this seemed to solve the problem of people never changing to other glyphs. Although it then created a new problem, where once you bought your glyphs, there is really no reason to ever buy any more of them. It was a system you basically did once and then just forgot about. So they tried to breathe some life into it over the expansions by adding more glyph slots, giving you some glyphs as you leveled up like abilities, removing damage from glyphs and only making them utility, but eventually they went the route of just removing anything that gave you any kind of combat benefit from glyphs, and made them all purely cosmetic. So glyphs still exist in the game today, and people do like cosmetics. So even in their completely nerfed version, they're still somewhat well liked, even if often forgotten about. And before we continue on to number 7, let's talk about the video sponsor, Surfshark VPN. What is a Surfshark VPN? Well, it's an easy to install run program that works on basically all of your devices, which helps you keep yourself safe online. For anyone who might travel a lot or even just use public Wi-Fi, like maybe going to a convention when that's a thing, a VPN is a good way to make sure people don't steal your information on vulnerable networks, or to log into your bank account from a server in your home country if you might be blocked out for some reason. It also has a feature that allows you to search something up without the internet spying on you. That way, if you're looking up different kinds of dog food, you're not going to be spammed with dog owning ads later on online. And more usefully, they can also be used to look at other countries' catalogs of stream content on various stream devices, like being able to watch The Office on Netflix if you change your region to the UK. So get Surfshark VPN at the link in the video description, enter promo code HERORREDX for 83% off and 3 extra months for free. Of course, just click on the link in the video description, we'll do that for you. And now, let's continue on with the video. And at number 7, we have Chromie Time. This is a feature introduced late in BFA, early Shadowlands, which basically changes the old world to scale with your level, all the way up to level 50. That way you can perfectly level up in any old expansion until you're ready to move on to current content, without having to worry about out-leveling the zone. Previously, if you wanted to experience the best leveling zones in the game, i.e. Silver Pine Forest and the Hillsbrad Foothills, you'd out-level the zones halfway through completing them, and kind of just stop gaining experience at a certain point. So you couldn't really play through the entire story of the zones without giving up some of your time, because of how fast the leveling had gotten over the years. And even if you could, a lot of the zones still started at very specific levels, so you'd have to choose to either do that level 10 zone and then never experience the story in another level 10 zone, unless you leveled up an alt. And now you can go on level through all the starting zones if you want, or play through the story of Legion if you started the game after that expansion. It's kind of a good system, that it's a wonder why it wasn't added to the game earlier. As before the system, the leveling content in World of Warcraft was kind of the weakest because of how all over the place the stories were. You would start the game in Cataclysm content, then advance and go back in time to Burning Crusade, where it would then continue forward to Wrath of the Lich King, where you would then fast forward to the point where you started the game in Cataclysm again, before you continued the story linearly in Mist of Pandaria, where you'd probably level halfway through the first zone, and then never explore the rest of the continent because it was only five level gaps. Although without Chromie Time, you can just level through all of the Pandaria expansion if you wish, starting off at the beginning, and experience all of the new lore added with that expansion. And at number six, we have the Allied Races. This is a feature added late Legion, early BFA, and is technically a mainstay feature of Battle for Azeroth expansion. And basically what it is, is it's just allowing you to play more races. You see, up until BFA, Blizzard had only added five new races to the game, and even less new classes. There are a lot of balancing problems with adding a new class to the game, as it creates a whole host of new balancing problems to learn, and new specs to counter in PvP, but adding a new race to the game, mechanically speaking, is pretty simple. Most racial benefits only impact your character by 1-2%. And I'd assume the biggest problem with them is just designing art and fitting all the armor that exists onto all of these new models. So, for some reason, Blizzard decided that they wanted to add 10 new races to the game, 
doubling the previous amount, and it was a hit. People liked having incentives to create new characters. They got people leveling in mass because they wanted to try out the new racials, or got people to race switch. Even I currently now play in one of the new allied races, a Zandalari troll, and that's because I liked its new racials. I even leveled up a new character to max level to unlock the heritage armor, even though I hadn't done a full level of new character since probably Warlord of Draenor. If they had just added chromie time in addition to the allied races, it would have been a match made in heaven of adding two complementary systems together. But they did do some leveling revamps of the allied race launch, which were good enough. Not as good as chromie time, but definitely good enough. And people who don't even like Battle for Azeroth agree that the allied race system that came from it was excellent. And in fact, they just kind of want more of them now. And at number five, we have mass summoning. Did you know, in Cataclysm, there was an ability in the game that allowed any raid member to summon the entire raid to the location in any location they wanted? You didn't have to wait for other people to come to your location to click on a meeting stone. You didn't have to have a warlock in your group. Just as long as you existed at a location in the open world, you could summon your entire raid to your location. This was such an incredibly useful and convenient feature that Blizzard removed it immediately after the expansion that introduced it. And of course, I'm talking about the guild perk have group world travel. With Cataclysm, Blizzard added a guild leveling system, which included a whole bunch of perks you can get. A lot of these perks are still in the game, just nerfed versions of what they once were. And Have Group Will Travel was a very long cooldown that everyone could learn that basically just teleported everyone to your location. There wasn't really any limitations on where in the open world you could use it. So some people were using it in order to raid enemy cities by just teleporting a full 40-man raid to their location. But its most useful application was just having one person make it to the raid entrance in order to summon everyone else. And it just made getting everyone to the raid and group a lot faster. So, why was it removed? Well, it was too convenient. Even if it did have a long cooldown, everyone could use it once before that cooldown incurred. And it essentially created a system of fast travel, where you could just have a friend log on and then summon to your location so you didn't have to fly there yourself. And of course, the open world PvP nightmares it caused of being able to summon 39 other people in the middle of an enemy city without any of them having to sneak in, except the one. You'd think the solution to this problem would be to make it so you could only use this ability inside raids or dungeons, but it actually worked the opposite way. It only functioned in the open world, so you had to run outside of a raid in order to summon your group to the front of it. This is probably one of the most convenient things they've ever added to the game that was removed because it was too darn convenient. So, let it be known, even Blizzard thinks they go too far with conveniences added to the game and will pull them back even if everyone likes it. And at number 4, we have Hard Mode Triggers. A hard mode trigger is doing a boss in a way that makes the encounter harder, and unlocks better rewards at the end of the encounter for going through the trouble. Technically, you can make any boss a hard mode by just doing it wrong, but there are some bosses which specifically reward you for doing the fight in a difficult way. The first of these was added with AQ40 with the Bug Trio, where depending on the order you kill the three bugs, you would get different loot, with killing Lord Kree being the hardest and awarding the best loot. Hard modes were just something they did occasionally on bosses when it made sense. And it wasn't until Wrath of the Lich King that they went ham on it. And Ulduar had the most amount of hard mode triggers out of every raid in the game's history. And players really liked the hard mode triggers. Some of the hard mode bosses in Ulduar were as simple as just pushing a button on the wall. Other ones were a lot more difficult, like trying to down a boss in less than two minutes, or completing an encounter without any of the mechanics specifically designed to help you win the encounter, like Yog Zero, one of the hardest raid fights of all time technically made so hard because of its hard mode trigger. And players liked hard mode triggers so much that it basically inspired the heroic and mythic difficulties we have today. Before Trial of the Crusader, the 25-man versions of raids was basically considered the heroic mode, and the 10-man versions were considered the normal modes. With TLC, they created a separate mode for both 10 and 25-man versions, and then really consolidated all of the difficulties at the end of Mist of Pandaria with the Warlord's pre-patch, giving us the modern-day LFR through Mythic modes we have today. But even with official game modes that make the fights harder, they still add hard mode triggers occasionally, with the most recent one being in Mechagon, as completing the dungeon in a harder way will award you a special achievement, a mount, a higher item level piece of equipment, and a rank 4 essence. And players just love the options of having hard modes, even if they're incredibly rare nowadays. And at number 3, we have the Mage Tower. This was a feature added mid-Legion, which was basically a minigame you could only attempt while you're on the Broken Shore and have the Mage Tower up, where the minigame was completing one difficult encounter, 
which would award you a cosmetic item in the form of a secret appearance for your artifact weapon. And the difficult encounter you did wasn't different for every single class and spec, but there was enough different ones for the various class and specs, where people didn't really mind that they didn't literally have 30 unique challenges. I completed 9 of the challenges back in Legion on 3 different classes, and I think I only repeated the same encounter twice amongst all 9 tries. And what people really liked about the Mage Tower was that it was an incredibly difficult solo encounter. It was like a legit mythic raid fight that you had to do all by yourself, and required you to learn the ins and outs of your class in order to counter everything. For example, my Discipline Priest, the encounter I had to complete was not a healing encounter, as the healing encounter was shared amongst all the healers and they gave that to the Holy Priest back instead. And since Dis was given a DPS challenge, which was tuned towards the current raid gear, and the new raid wasn't even out yet, I was horribly undergeared for that DPS challenge, and still managed to complete it on my first go around before the Mage Tower went down, after about 60 attempts. And it's probably the hardest solo challenge I've ever done in the game. Basically, what I had to do was use one of my talents creatively to make up for my lack of gear, with the talent called Twist of Fate. Twist of Fate in Legion would give you a 20% damage and healing buff if you healed a target that was below 35% health. The boss you had to fight would occasionally put a dot on you, which would do so much damage you had to dispel it essentially or pop a defensive cooldown for it. But instead, I would just kind of leave it on myself, and then constantly heal myself at 35% health in order to allow my passive heals to allow me to constantly get that 20% damage buff for 10 seconds. And there were a lot of mechanics in the fight which required you to be at full health in order to just not die. So I had to learn the ins and outs of everything in order to know when to heal myself to full, and when I could leave myself at 35% health in order to keep the buff active. On the Frost Mage fight, there was a mechanic where you had to stand inside an orb, otherwise it would explode and kill you, and I had to learn to micromanage my Frost Elemental in order to stand in it in order to get all of them, and I haven't had to micromanage a pet since Wrath of the Lich King when I used to main a hunter. On my Rogue, I had to learn the best way to burst DPS down three hands before they could reach the boss and wipe me. On the Arcane Mage challenge, I had to keep one of the mobs permanently CC throughout the entire fight, and not let any of my AoEs hit him, while also having to do AoE damage occasionally. Basically, all of the fights required you to learn the classes and specs you are playing pretty well, and it's the only challenge in the game that incentivized me to want to play some of my alts that I've never touched in any kind of competitive way, and even gear them up. And that was kind of the main selling point of the Mage Tower scenarios. They were difficult and full of a whole bunch of mechanics that required you to use your whole toolbox. But also, if you just waited long enough, the last tier of raiding would give you good enough gear where you could just kind of brute force most of them. So even for the people who couldn't complete them at level, could eventually complete them anyway. And I think if the Mage Tower hadn't been released in the middle patch, it might not have been as well loved as it ended up being, because they were so difficult that if there was no way to brute force them, people would just complain about them being too hard and Blizzard would eventually nerf them. Instead, the natural progression of gear nerfed them, so they got to stay the same way for the whole expansion. And people love the Mage Tower system so much that it's kind of a wonder why they still haven't implemented a spiritual successor yet, since Blizzard seems very keen on copying past successes, as we'll see in the next spot on this list. And at number 2, we have the Timeless Isle. This was an island added at the end of Mista Pandaria, which was a small little circular island that disallowed any flying on the island, and basically just had a couple of weekly quests you can do, and some cosmetics to farm. And everybody loved the Timeless Isle so much that Blizzard has constantly been trying to recreate its success. So, what's so good about the Timeless Isle? Well, I think it was kind of a combination of a whole bunch of small things just adding up to coincidentally complement each other perfectly. The Timeless Isle was basically a zone dedicated to farming rares, pets, mounts, achievements, and catch-up gear for alts. There were a lot of little treasures on the island that would require you to play a little minigame in order to unlock them, like walking across a tightrope, doing puzzle platforming, or just completing mini-events. And the treasures had a chance to give you currency, cosmetics, and the catch-up gear. And the catch-up gear was great. Basically, all expansion since has had catch-up gear as well, but none of them were as easy to get as it was on the Timeless Isle. You can get a near full set of equipment and just send it to an alt, which would prepare them for the normal mode whatever the current raid tier was. It was so convenient and easy to get the catch-up gear, that basically the best way to gear up an alt was just to run around the Timeless Isle on your main. And while you're running around getting the catch-up gear, you'd also got currency which allowed you to buy mounts and pets and other cosmetics. But you needed the appropriate wrap in order to unlock those things. And that's kind of where the mobs of the zone came into play. Pretty much everything you killed gave you rep, and half the creatures on the zone were elite mobs. 
Some of the trash mobs of the Timeless Isle were harder than some of the group quests in modern day Elite Quests. They were hard, and you died a lot on the Timeless Isle. And since it was hard, it kind of encouraged people to work together. And if you killed enough Elites, sometimes a rare Elite would spawn in its place, which almost always dropped something really valuable, like a rare pet you could sell in the auction house for a couple tens of thousands of gold. So people would constantly be calling out the rare Elite spawns or forming up groups to farm Elites, most commonly the frogs in the coast since they had the fastest respawn timer. And while you were riding to locations, you would sometimes just come across a treasure, or a zone buff, which would drastically increase the power level of your character on the Timeless Isle. There's also the middle area which had a world boss that you could kill, as well as a secret area in the top of the world boss that you could only access if you had the legendary cloak from the expansion. And one of the most important things about the Timeless Isle was that the terrain was flat. There was no weird navigation. There was an upper level which had an obvious ramp and bridges, and navigating through the zone was pretty easy, just following a road or just running directly to a location since it was basically a round circle. There's no confusing elevations or cliffs. If someone called out a rare spawn, it was real easy to actually get there without looking for a hidden entrance to an underground cave or something. And if you were progressing on the Timeless Island in Alt, it had a natural sense of power progression, as you couldn't access everywhere solo because there were places with harder elites than others. And since the gear dropped pretty much everywhere, you did eventually get good enough gear to go to the higher places to farm there. And then if you ran on a PvP server, it opened up a whole other side of the Timeless Isle. Basically, it was WoW's only successful sandbox zone. You got to choose what you wanted to do, as the weekly quest basically just had you kill a couple of creatures, and you could finish those pretty easily. After that, you were free to just explore and choose what you wanted to work on. And almost everything you did would get you rewards towards whatever goal you were looking for. This is why Blizzard has been constantly trying to copy the success of the Timeless Isle. As in Warlords of Draenor, they released the Tannen Jungle in the last raid patch, which was supposed to be similar to the Timeless Isle with rares, treasures, catch-up gear, and a whole bunch of pets or whatever, but the zone was too big, and the rewards just weren't as good as the Timeless Isle. They then tried again in Legion with Argus, basically the same thing by adding a whole bunch of rares, treasures, cosmetics to find, but Argus was created with story first and was even bigger and more confusing, so it didn't really hit the mark. Then they tried again in BFA with Nashatar and Mechagon, and I think they came the closest to capturing the magic with Mechagon, but Najatar also had the same problem just being too big, and even more confusing to navigate than Argus. And every time they release one of these Timeless Isle-like zones, they always say it's going to be the Timeless Isle 2.0. But it never is. They try to recreate it in every expansion since Mr. Pandaria. At this point, it just kind of seems like lightning in the bottle that they might never actually be able to make something as good. But they keep trying anyway, and I do applaud them for attempting sandbox zones, even if they constantly fall up short to the Timeless Isle. And at number one, we have the Mythic Plus Dungeons. Now, a little story about the history of dungeons. In the beginning, dungeons were designed like Dungeons & Dragons dungeons, where the game designers thought you would only do them once, so they made them as big as possible to make that single experience enjoyable. Then they found people really like to farm the Scarlet Dungeons. So in the Burning Crusade, they modeled all of their dungeons after the Scarlet Crusade dungeons, and made them all small and repeatable, and even added heroic modes so they'd be relevant at high levels. In Wrath of the Lich King, they did pretty much the same thing, but the dungeons became a joke once players got to a point where they could just ignore all the mechanics and plow through them in less than 10 minutes with their higher and higher raid gear. And since Wrath of the Lich King was the first time the game had a long content drought at the end of the expansion, Players were used to plowing through dungeons in their ICC gear in less than 10 minutes, and assumed that it was the case that all the dungeons were just super easy, and they really wanted to return to the harder dungeons of Classic and Burning Crusade. So, at the beginning of Cataclysm, they created harder dungeons again, and hyped them up as a selling point of the expansion. And they were so hard that players complained like crazy until Blizzard nerfed all of them to be less hard. And then that was the end of hard dungeons all the way until Legion. In Legion, Blizzard taking heavy inspiration from Diablo 3's Rift system allowed you to run the same dungeon on a harder difficulty, and reward you better gear if you were to complete it in a fixed time limit, with the gear getting better and better until at around a plus 10 or a plus 15. And also, the gear was competitive with other endgame gear, and also, the most important part, could be farmed indefinitely, instead of once a week like a raid. Now, players like being able to farm good gear indefinitely, but they also really liked the mechanic behind it of just running a dungeon at harder and harder difficulties for better and better rewards. And it was basically a success from the get-go, and is accepted as a pillar of endgame content in modern WoW today. Before the Mythic Plus system, endgame content in World of Warcraft was raiding or PvP, 
after the introduction of Mythic Pluses, it now became raiding, Mythic Plus dungeons, and PvP. It's a completely viable thing to spend all of your time progressing and never touching raiding or PvP, but might incentivize you to do the other two to get better gear in order to complete Mythic Dungeons faster at higher key. The system also has a built-in feature where you can go past the maximum gear rewards for just pure prestige, as whenever someone completes a really high Mythic Plus dungeon, it's reported on all of the World of Warcraft news websites, even if there's no real in-game reward for completing a plus 25. The Mythic Plus system is probably the most successful new system they've ever added to the game, and this system is designed in a way where it's infinitely repeatable as well in next expansions, unlike trying to capture the magic of why the original Timeless Isle was great. With Mythic Plus Dungeons, all you have to do is just make new dungeons. They even try out new things like seasonal affixes, which are a mixed bag of sometimes great or sometimes terrible, most often the latter. Basically, the core system of Mythic Plus Dungeons is an enjoyable gameplay loop, and basically all the other extras attached to it just require some work and tweaking, like removing some of the terrible affixes, or making the gear not terrible like it was at the launch of Shadowlands. In fact, I've seen some people talk about Mythic Plus system as the main reason they still play the game over other MMOs, because other MMOs haven't been able to copy the Mythic Plus system yet, and you know you have a good system when it's a main selling point of the game. At the end of Battle for Azeroth, I made a goal for myself to complete the Keystone Master achievement before Shadowlands launched, and it was some of the most fun I had playing the game, as there was a lot that went into trying to pug a plus 15 on all the dungeons. And while I was doing it, I was surprised to see so many people still doing Mythic Plus Dungeons even that late into the expansion. Which is why Mythic Plus Dungeons easily take the number one on this list. Nothing else really comes close in the form of new systems that were added. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any other really good systems that were added to the game that I might have missed? If so, I'd really love to hear about them down in the comments. People rarely talk about the good systems added to the game, so it was kind of hard to find it. 